Well, I love that dad's practical illustration and all the jars he had. I'd want, Craig and I had seen that and um, we had that system when our kids were younger until we were robbed. And uh, the thieves then took all the jars of money that were our kids. So now we just do an online Excel spreadsheet. This is just far easier. <laughs> well, today's message is called Sermon on the Amount. And it's a bit of play on words of a very famous sermon that Jesus did called Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you're fairly new to church here and you don't know much about the concept of giving, don't worry about this really much at all. First of all, take hold of all that God wants to give you. That's the most important thing. Take hold of everything that God wants to give you. And then I pray that this message would help all of us understand a little bit more that God wants us to live a life where our whole heart is completely devoted to Him and that generosity just becomes a way of living for all of us. But before we get into that, rewind a little bit to earlier in our service and there was a video Bible passage about a story of the rich young ruler. A very interesting story and I believe this story gives us a framework as to how we can really look through the lens of generosity. Well let's put the rich young ruler into today's terms. He was well educated so probably equivalent to perhaps a well-educated young man today, maybe being through university, potentially even postgraduate study. He scored himself a well-paying job. He's starting to find opportunities in life. And not only that, it's brought him a bit of wealth, a bit of power, and with his extra cash, he's been able to buy himself a few toys. He's in a sweet spot. But although this young man is in a sweet spot materially, he wasn't in a sweet spot spiritually. And I feel he senses this. He must. Otherwise, why would he come to Jesus? You see, there's a large crowd around Jesus. As usual, poor Jesus. Large crowds and him are synonymous. And there's this large crowd and this young man, he must have wanted to put himself out there. He wears his heart on his sleeve and he goes up to Jesus in front of people. And he says, teacher, what good thing must I do for eternal life? He reflects on a common assumption that eternal life in Jesus is found on what he does and not who he is. Oh, sorry, I'll just go back one. There it is. Jesus' reply is to try to help the young man understand that focusing only on external things, and so he, Jesus lists all the commandments that are to do with how you treat others. So you can sort of tick them off and think, oh yeah, I haven't done that, and I haven't done that, I've obeyed that, I'm in a good place. So the young man then says to Jesus, all these commandments I have kept, what do I still lack? Now, let's just have a look at the 10 commandments here. These were a set of commandments that God gave uh, the Israelite people way back in the early part of the Bible. And their idea was that they were to try and obey these, and when you obey these, you're gonna live a better life. Now, this young man has said, I have obeyed these perfectly. What planet is this guy on? Who would say publicly in front of a crowd that you have obeyed all of these commandments perfectly? No one can do this. Only Jesus kept that kind of standard. Now, perhaps some in the crowd are kind of like sniggering and laughing and thinking, this guy, he's on himself. Who can obey this perfectly? And maybe some of his friends there are telling, well, I can tell you a few things about this guy. <laughs> but even with his answer and his belief that he is somehow still living a perfect life, something is still missing. 
Because he then says, but what do I still lack? He's aware something isn't quite right. Something is missing in his approach to life. Now, this is where things get really interesting because Jesus' answer is absolutely shocking. Jesus says, well, actually, if you want to be perfect, go, sell all your possessions, all these nice toys and things that you have bought, and give your money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. (laughs) What? What kind of a requirement is this? Is Jesus insane at this point to ask someone to get rid of everything that they have? What kind of a standard is that? But the word I just want us to unpack just fractionally here this morning is this word, perfect. Now, the word in the original Greek text of the time doesn't actually mean perfect as we might understand it as being sinless. Rather, the word perfect Jesus is using here means whole, undivided, mature, a whole heart. And in doing this, Jesus is very subtly, but kind of clearly, revealing what the real issue is for this young man. He has a divided heart. Ouch! It's a bit harsh having your sort of weaknesses displayed out in front of everybody, isn't it? Jesus knew this man's weakness. He loved money more than he loved God. And by asking him to sell everything, Jesus was actually challenging him to examine his own heart and to look at his priorities. So if Jesus is asking this of this young man, does he ask the same of us? Are we expected to sell everything we own? Is that the test that's being put towards us as well? Well, take a deep breath. I don't believe so, okay? In fact, there are plenty of wealthy, God-honouring people in the Bible who didn't sell up everything to follow Jesus. A guy called Abraham, he was super wealthy, crazy wealthy. And look, imagine the disaster we would all be in if all of us here just sold everything. No house, no car, no possessions, and we just sold everything to follow Jesus. We'd be creating a real burden for other people. You see, it's okay to possess wealth as long as it doesn't possess you. It's okay to possess wealth as long as it doesn't possess you. But the young man, he didn't really like what Jesus said. I can understand that. And it says, well, he went away sad because he had great wealth He left sad and he left without what he actually came to Jesus for. He knew something was missing. Jesus kind of revealed what it was, but he went away sad. He had a choice. He could follow with his whole heart or with a divided heart. You see, it wasn't that he could not. It was that he would not. Okay, there's a bit of a difference there. It wasn't that man could not, it was that he would not. It's quite a confronting thought, isn't it, for each of us to even apply that. Is it sometimes that we could not or is it that we would not? Well, Jesus goes on to say to the disciples who are standing around watching this whole banter and interaction, and he says to them, you know what, it's actually easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus, you think he must have had a sense of humour here to make this kind of illustration. Obviously, a huge camel cannot go through the eye of a needle, but there's also another eye of the needle. 
In the walls of Jerusalem, around the city at the time, they used to have these little gaps, and they were also called the eye of the needle. And they were just little places where people could slip in and out of the city quickly without going through the main gates. Now, again, for those listening to this at the time, they would have known about these. And again, there's no way a camel <laughs> can fit through the eye of the needle there. But this illustration is really enforcing this whole idea. It's really impossible for someone to be so sold out to their money and their wealth and to God. It's not possible to have the two. The heart is going to always be divided. Let's think about the disciples listening to this. They'd been listening intently. They were shocked at what Jesus had said. And they thought, well, who on earth can be saved then? This just all sounds way too hard. But I just love that Jesus doesn't leave the disciples in a hopeless state. And he responds with this verse. It says, with man, all things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It suddenly becomes possible to put God first with our finances. It suddenly becomes possible to live without an undivided heart. Because with God, there is always hope. There is always hope with our finances and our givings. There are always possibilities. There's always a way through the situation. There's always a belief that we can follow God wholeheartedly. So if our approach to giving should be about having an undivided heart, it kind of doesn't quite answer the question that this sermon title suggests, the Sermon on the Amount. After all, Sermon on the Amount kind of says a, a number or perhaps or a quantity that we should be giving, whereas this Bible passage about this rich young ruler talks about having an undivided heart. If you're watching online and if you're here in church, you know we talk each week about giving generously. It's an important part of our worship. It's an important part of who we are and what we're all about here at this church. So is there then a particular amount we should be giving or tithing? Let's just unpack this together. So you hear about this word tithe. So what actually is tithing? What does it actually mean? So a tithe is essentially a tenth of something, okay? In biblical days, People would pay a tithe, generally of agricultural products, because they were pretty much all farming. And um, they would give a tenth of their produce, grain, etc., crops, whatever. So tithing is really then becomes this like act of worship. And today we think of tithing as giving a tenth to our church. And this is an act of worship to us. And at NBC, when you tithe your 10%, it really enables our church to be fully resourced. It pays for our buildings. It pays for the upkeep of our property. It pays for mission and, and uh, ministry. It pays for our staff. It pays the electricity, the lights, etc., as well as any future planning. So then if that's what tithing is, then essentially what is its purpose? Well, tithing is actually God's idea. As the dad in the video said, God basically built the system, okay? And Deuteronomy chapter 14, 23 says, the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. And the dad in the video also talked to his daughter about giving the first fruits. Tithing is simply about putting God first. He first loved us. He first gave to us. And so tithing is a response. It's giving back to him because of all he's given to us. So where in the Bible does it actually say to tithe? Well, 
The Bible is divided into two sections, the Old Testament, which was before Jesus' time, and then the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, we journey through the story of the Israelite people. Now, these were uh, people that God called his special people, his chosen people, and he wanted them to live in a way that would point other nations towards God. And he gave them guidelines about how to live and instructions about tithing. And the law for the Israelites was to give 10% of their agricultural products to God. It was a reminder to the Israelites that all they had was God's first anyway. And it was a show of thankfulness for his provision. Leviticus 27 30 says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. So that's how the Old Testament guides us. But then you get to the New Testament when Jesus comes along and he just throws everything on its head again. In true radical Jesus style, he makes the standard so much higher, really. Jesus, though, doesn't talk about the nitty gritty of tithing. He totally affirms the practice of tithing, but he takes it to a whole new level. He reveals that tithing and generosity is way more than just about money. Generous living is about the heart. It's like a way of life. It's having that undivided heart for God first. So sometimes when we think about tithing, we can think, well, can I include other causes in my tithing? Well, if we look back at the Bible, and we can kind of get a bit of an idea about what would happen then. In the Old Testament, they would tithe their 10% of their agricultural products. Then they also had these things called free will offerings. And these were voluntary gifts for specific purposes. And they were up to the household as to what they gave, but there were some sort of parameters and suggestions about that as well. And if you were to add up what the Israelites would have given with their tithe and say their free will offerings, it ended up being about 23% of their income. And today, many of us here make many offerings We give to perhaps cancer research. We give to maybe the guide dogs. We give to self-denial when we do that here at church, even our extravagant acts. And giving to these causes and charities is fantastic, but it's actually not the same as tithing. It's called giving to a charity or a cause. Tithing is, first of all, an act of worship to God and is given to the church. So here's a bit of an interesting question. Do I tithe from gross or net income? Do I tithe from salary sacrifice benefits, interest from bank accounts, shared dividends, insurance payouts, prize money, or even an inheritance? What do you think? Do you tithe from that as well? What does the Bible say? It doesn't really say. It doesn't give specifics for every situation. Rather, it gives us guidelines to work out what we think is right in God's eyes. And we do this through reading the Bible, through prayer, and perhaps talking to some other wise people. But there is a Bible verse that can help us with this, and it's from Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. And it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, And the storehouse that was being referred to here is really where people would bring their tithe. And I guess today we might refer to that as the church as well. And probably where it says whole tithe, it kind of really, I think, means everything that God has enabled you to earn or to gain. Here's another one about, we're talking about the Sermon on the Amount. How do you figure out the amount? Well, what if I don't know how much I'm earning from week to week? There would be a number of you here in this situation, I would imagine. Your shifts change and you sometimes get paid overtime and that sort of thing. This is just a reality of this day of this day and age. And you have a couple of options. You can pray and plan to set a weekly amount and you give that each week. 
or you just look back over the last fortnight's paycheck and you tithe from that amount there. But what if my husband or wife isn't on board with tithing? This is a tough one when a married couple isn't on the same page with what to give. And I appreciate many difficulties in relationships are because of money. So it's very sensitive. Firstly, I would suggest pray about it and ask God to bring unity. And then, unless it's going to cause major strife, try to talk about it. I think, though, you can try to give from what you have control over. If you only have control over what you earn, then you can tithe from that. If you have no control or it's sensitive around what somebody else earns, you just leave that up to them. That's not your call then, really. But I do appreciate this can be a sensitive topic. And then finally, well, what if I can't afford to tithe or I only have a tiny bit left over? How can I make ends meet? Well, I guess this is where your thinking has to change. We need to actually reverse and flip our thinking around. It's not about tithing with what is left over at the end of the week. It's tithing, first of all, from all that God gives us and trusting him then to supply and to give what we need. It's realising that he's basically saying, if you give me the first 10%, you have the other 90% to live on. I appreciate that this is all easier said than done. And for many of us, it's a journey. In fact, there's a bit of a saying that says it can take seven years to convert someone's wallet. You might come to know Jesus, but then it sort of takes seven years to sort of hand over control of the finances. I pray that won't be the case for us. The numbers there, 18, 29 says, present the best and the holiest of everything given to you. I don't know if you remember last year when we had our generosity series, we were online and actually Kelly was interviewed at the time. And she has a particular time each week when she gets paid and her tithe comes out straight away and she sets a reminder on her phone, I've never forgotten this, Cal, so she can remember, to, I think, to pray and to thank God and be reminded that she's giving at that moment. That's about giving to God first. So to clarify, what is the amount we should give? Well, I believe we can still use the 10% as a guideline for us today for our tithe in church. And then any gifts or gifts to charities and causes is essentially over and above this. But Jesus changed the whole goalposts on giving to really be about the attitude and the spirit and condition of your heart. Because more importantly, Jesus is looking for followers of him who will follow him with an undivided heart. Because when we do this, then actually the amount doesn't even matter anymore. And perhaps a little test to give yourself right now is by thinking that a heart that is fully right with God will actually have no problems giving 10% or even more. And if you're having trouble with that right now, perhaps it's worth considering why. God also understands that different stages of life means that you have different capacity to give. You know, from a child tithing from their pocket money when they're, you know, really little, to stu students, to empty nesters, to earning a decent income, to being retired. There's the whole gamut. And it doesn't matter what stage we're in, we can apply this idea of our heart to this situation. Some of you could be thinking, well, my tithe is measly, and it, it, how could it even make a difference? I might have told you that my first tithe when I was a child, I first started getting pocket money when I was eight, and my parents, they never really spoiled us. Sorry, Mum and Dad, I know you're watching, but it's true. Um, I used to get five cents for every year I'd lived. It sounds like I was living in the Depression, doesn't it? I wasn't. But... So I would get 40 cents a week pocket money, okay? And I would tithe, I would take to Sunday school at the time, 
eight cents. True. Okay? Some of you have probably done something like this over in the, par- in the past. But what did that teach me as a little girl? Honour God first with your money. And I used to take that eight cents. Now, fortunately now, I have capacity to give a lot more than eight cents. But at the time, I was learning what it meant to follow God with an undivided heart. You know, I love this verse. It's one of my favourite. 1 Samuel 16, 7. It says, people look at the outward appearance, but guess where God looks? Right at your heart. And just as Jesus saw into the heart of that young man, that rich young ruler, Jesus sees right into each of our hearts today. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows where you have perhaps some divided loyalties and some stumbling blocks, and possibly when that comes to your money and possessions. Some of you might be thinking, well, this is just impossible. You don't know my financial situation. And next week, the message is actually called Tired of Being Broke. (laughs) So that might help unpack that a little bit more. But Jesus has assured us that if our heart is right with him, then all things are possible. I want to invite the band to join me this morning. There's a song that was sort of re- I've requested them to sing that I love. It's about Waymaker. It's called Waymaker. And I love the chorus because it says that God is a waymaker, he's a miracle worker, and he is a promise keeper. And God keeps the promises that he has in the Bible. And when he asks us to honour him first with our tithe and trust him with the rest, we have to believe that he will come through with that. He will make a way. I don't know where you're at this morning. You might like to sit in your seat this morning and just pray about your financial situation. Ask God to examine your heart. See if there's something that's divided in there today. And offer your finances to Him again. Let's together, collectively, let's step more and more into being the generous people that God wants us to be. That we will have nothing holding us back. You might like to come forward and recommit yourself, recommit your finances to the Lord. Ask Him to do a miracle. I know what that's like for God to do a miracle in your finances. It's amazing. God can do it again and again and again. That's what He promises. And also, if you're watching at home online, you might like to ring the pre- text the prayer line and someone can call you back if you would like prayer about this matter. So in these moments of reflection, ask God about the state of your heart.